So what are we drinking today, Matthew? Whatever Rachel mixed for me. It's a mule. But it's uh, a mule with gin instead of whatever a mule normally has in it. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I know a Moscow mule is vodka. Yeah, it's a vodka. But it, it's just a mixed drink with ginger beer. Yeah, but it generally has vodka in it. Mm. Not gin. So this is a juniper mule because gin is made from juniper. So gotcha. it's gin, gin, ginger beer, seltzer, splash of cranberry juice, couple lime wedges, splash of lime juice, and seltzer to cut the ginger because we got extra hot ginger beer. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. So welcome back. Welcome friends. back, friends. It's time for another episode. It's our third to last in the flesh episode. I was like, it's not penultimate once the one that comes before penultimate. But I couldn't think of it. But it's season two, Air episode penul- four. Penultimate. Yeah, the pre penultimate. The pen penultimate. Air pen- penultimate. E R E apostrophe. Oh, the air like before. Okay. Yeah. I like get you. Air before. yesterday is the day before yesterday. All right. Fine. It's fine. I, I will concede this. But we're just going to do this before we forget. Hi, I'm Rachel. And I'm Matt. Welcome to the Strange and Beautiful Book Club. wild month i hope everybody's been enjoying the in the flesh season we will be back to our regularly scheduled programming starting in august well july the programming schedule is updated yeah but we'll be back to like a this is what you can expect from here on out yes yeah so we'll be doing our come in 81 kilo which will be coming out on its own stream so our forever night episodes will be back uh, Feast, Sheath, and Shatter has gone to a bi-monthly, at least bi-monthly. If we get excited and release more, we might, but we won't release any fewer than a bi-monthly schedule. And that's Bonus for, episodes. That's for Feast, Sheath, and Shatter, which is formerly known as Book Talks with Kate. And the Strange and Beautiful Book Club will be back to our movie episodes, but we will be adding in book and movie episodes. And I had hoped to do more movie episodes this month, but this month has, and I don't feel like this is exaggerating, kicked our asses. Matt just nodded emphatically. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm kind of glad that I'd given myself a whole month. I think I might just make it in a month. For the nine episodes? For the all the big moving around. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah and the infrastructure. All the infrastructure changes. I think I might just make it. Maybe. Hopefully. I will. I'm going to do it. I'm going to yeah. do it. I'm going to do it. And but, we're still taking a long weekend for our surprisingly large number wedding anniversary. Yeah. This is our 15th wedding anniversary. Happy anniversary, honey. Happy anniversary. And you know what we're doing? Talking about a BBC zombie show on the podcast we started together. It's really exciting. Um, I don't know. I wouldn't be doing a podcast with anybody else. D- except for Kate. I mean, like I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't have started a podcast with anybody else. Okay. How about, how about that? That works. How about that? Okay. I'm trying to tell you I love you. Would you quit making a joke out of it? I love you, too. Okay. So, back to In the Flesh. (laughs) I love how this episode starts. So, we start out, and it's Amy at home, and she's, like, sitting at the end of the bed, and you don't quite see her face, and she's wearing a robe. Oh, yeah. It's real, like, dreamy, like, gauzy, lots of light light. This is actually a dream. It's Philip's dream. Oh, Philip. Yes, because Amy is like, Philip, I just can't stop thinking about you. I want you so bad. 
I want you to touch me. And Philip's like, okay, yeah, tell me more about that. And she's like, Philip, teach me how to give you pleasure. <laughs> wow, Philip. Oh, Philip. Philip's having a, a, a wet dream about Amy. And his mom wakes him up because there's a visitor. Why does everybody sleep in twin beds? It's England. Do uh, we space have... is at a premium. I get, uh, that's a huge assumption. People uh, are bigger than they used to be. So modern people have to fit into the smaller space that the ancestors lived in. <laughs> so wait, wait, wait. So what you're saying <laughs> is the population of England hasn't changed, but the dimensions of the people in the population have changed increased so both. greatly both both the average size of people in general has increased i guess okay western civilizations europe and america okay although in china it, the effect has been pretty pronounced over the last 30 years there's a whole big thing called the china study this like longitudinal study they do yeah. stuff every few years um uh, body like height is increasing. Okay. Like year over year. No, I'm listening. And yep. uh, and then you hit some threshold, and then body weight does the same thing. So, what you're okay? Uh, hang on. That's why if you go to really old cities, yeah, like coastal New England. Okay. Historic buildings. Right. The doorways are all short. Well, for me. I'm I'm about seventeen hairs under six feet. And yeah. There are some doorways in like old school New England that I have to duck to get through. And we don't think this is structural or material. Uh, it's mostly a nutrition during youth. Okay. I meant like thing. structural, like your wall is stronger. Oh, no, no. The doors the were sized for smaller. people okay. of the age. Got gotcha. you. And, and there were this, people. How does this relate back to twin beds? Okay. Okay. The bedrooms are sized proportionally to the size of the person. Okay. So if the average adult male was like five foot six... Like, 150 years ago when these buildings were built. Mm -hmm. And now the, and now Philip is like six foot or six foot one. The room is pretty small. The only bed that you could fit in a small bedroom and still have room to move around is a small bed. Okay. And so now you have modern sized males, male human beings around like, 5'10", average height. Philip's a little big. Bigger than average. So Amy says. And so, <laughs> so he's, his says, bed okay. looks really small. The bed is small for yeah, him. Yeah, I just, the twin beds throw me off every time. Like an adult person it's, sleeping in a twin it's bed. England. It could be infantilizing. It could be like these people still live at home. You can tell because they don't even have a big bed. Our daughter wants a twin bed. Well, only because she wants more floor space in her room. But you know what more I'm going room at. for activities. Yeah. Okay. All right, fine. Well, the twin bed, we're going to table the twin bed discussion. Yes, it, it is. Um, we're going to put it, it on the shelf. incongruous. We're going to put it on the shelf next to the airspeed velocity of an unladen vampire in the Forever Night universe. Of an underwater vampire. A water <laughs> speed velocity <laughs> of an underwater <laughs> vampire. <laughs> Uh, okay, we're just that's it. See it on the shelf. Boop, I just stuck it. Listen to our forever night episodes for context. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then we cut to actual Amy, and she's looking through the kitchen, and there's nothing in the cupboards or the refrigerator. And she's like, What am I the only person who lives here? And so finally, she opens the door, and there's granola bars in the cupboard. And she starts to eat a granola bar, and then she's like, Whoa, wait, wait, what, what the, the fuck? fuck am I doing? I don't eat food. And she spits it out like, ugh, gross. People food. <laughs> Do they have garbage disposals in old English villages? I don't think you can make generalities about anything where anybody lives. It's not like they live in, they 
they actually occupy like the Stone Age or something. Like they can go out and buy a garbage disposal. If you live in a modern suburb of Los Angeles and your house was built in the last 10 years, you're probably going to have a garbage disposal. Look, you can install a garbage disposal in anything. So my but thoughts... But it's not recommended if you have a septic tank. Okay, all right. They don't have a septic tank. Uh, they don't. They're in sure? row housing, I'm sure. Okay, they're in row housing to start with. There's not room for a septic tank. We don't know if their land is perkable. We don't know if it's possible. Percolatable. We don't know if it's possible to have a septic tank. If we're going to go off English television and whether or not they are often portrayed okay, hey, what no let me finish okay. whether or not they're often portrayed as having a garbage disposal in british television there is a being human episode where the garbage disposal keeps getting stuck keeps getting jammed is that after or before they move to wales that is before because it's before amy realizes that she is clogging the plumbing in the house gotcha okay so not amy sally set so, or Sally's the English, the American being American human version. Woman. Well, the ghost character. Wow, her name just Annie. Annie. Shit sticks. Her name just <sighs> oh, fled Annie. my. Maybe I really I like the Annie character. Yeah, Annie was a good character. Anyway, back to the. Yeah, she spits the granola bar in the sink. That's why we're having this discussion. And it feels like the day for having off topic discussions. So I need you to focus, okay? Well,. Focus. I, I, I want to make a couple okay, points. No, go. Okay. All right. Get them all out. Let's get them all out. One. Yes. She spits it into the sink. Indeed she And does. does not clean it up. No. And in retrospect, that's not really an issue. No. Because nobody's using the sink anyway. No. Nobody's drinking. Nobody's washing dishes. Unless they wash out their apple cider vinegar. That That's true. Yeah. yeah. And... As a reference point to the technological implementation in the in Rorton, this is taking place in 2013. Yep. Nobody has a smartphone. It's sort of a stunted 2013. Exactly. Yeah. So, probably no garbage disposals. Well, it's not like garbage disposals were invented in 2009. Well, they were invented a lot earlier than that but her grandmother could have put in a garbage disposal in the 80s and she could proportionally still have it. to the time of this show and the time of invention of certain things let me ask you a question you could say let me ah, ask you a maybe, question maybe, can maybe i ask not. you a question of how course. important to the plot overall is it that amy has a garbage disposal or does not have a garbage disposal it's Does relevant it? to how automatic it is for her to spit the for sink. her to spit solid food into the sink. Okay, this could have been a filming decision because then she wouldn't have had to interact with a trash can. We can keep her face all at about the same plane. Okay, if she but just that spits still has plot implications. Does it? Do it we reference this granola bar being in the sink again? No, and that's okay. part of the problem. Okay, well, can we can we move on? Because of the insects. Can we can we move on? I bet the No, can I partially dead syndrome <laughs> sufferers really have to worry about insect populations in their domiciles. Okay, so the next thing that happens is uh Henry's mom is the one who's at Philip's house. I'm just dis disregarding all of that. Okay. So Henry's mom is at Philip's house. She, she is the guest. God, you got me so far off. Okay. She is the guest that is at Philip's house. Mission accomplished. <laughs> because Henry is still missing. Oh, no. And as far as she can tell, nobody gives a shit. Um, as far as... All of the characters that have responded to the knowledge that Henry is missing, actually nobody gives a shit. I know. And you know what I really like about sad. you know what I like about this show? Nobody is taken in by the poor attempts at deception of the other characters. So like when Simon used Kieran as a way to get the key, Kieran knew it immediately. Love it. And Maxine talked to the mom last time. 
And remember, she was like, oh, well, what, what were his memories of the rising? And the mom was like, what does that have to do with anything? Well, this time she's like, listen, I knew that Maxine Martin was lying to me, and I don't want to talk to her anymore. I thought she was going to be the one who was able to help me. But instead, she lied to me. And I don't want to talk to her. Every word that she said since she came here has been a lie. And you're like, wow. Good job, Henry Lonsdale's mom, for picking that up mm-hmm. right off the bat. She's like, Mm-mm, that woman is full of shit. I want to talk to somebody. I want help. And I want Philip to help me. And because Philip's like, Philip grew up next door. Oh, yeah. Philip's like, yeah. Oh, you know what? I'm going to, um, yeah, I'll talk to Maxine about that. Like maybe today. I don't know. It could be tomorrow. And she's like, listen, I need you to talk to about, talk about my son at this very important meeting, this very important meeting that is coming up today. We have to talk about him. And Philip doesn't say anything, but, um, his mom is eventually his, like, she'll I'm, do it. He'll I'm do familiar it. with this. A mother of some type volunteering you for some activity. <laughs> yeah, but this is life or death. I mean, this is a child well, yeah. that's gone missing. This is a little the, bit different. To than, be fair, than Matt, this can is you a legitimate purpose. Come over and fix underneath my sink. Instance of yeah. getting volunteered by somebody else to do something. Right, and then we immediately go to the PDS are at the like rec hall, the town hall, the. The civic center where everything appears to happen. And they are having a training seminar. So Dean is trying to train the mother-in-law oh, of Dean. B&B lady. And he's like, okay, now you shake my hand. And so she shakes her his hand. And he's like, oh, cold. I'm scared. And she's like, oh, I'm sorry. He's like, no, no, no. Follow the script. And she's like, I'm sorry. I am a PDS sufferer. It is not my fault that my body temperature is low. I have had my neurotriptyline within the last 24 hours. Like they have a prescribed script that they have to go off of when they're interacting. To with calm the, the populace. Yeah. He's like, you're trying to keep me from being scared. And he ends up giving her a six out of 10. He's like, and you know why you got that six. And then she goes Dean to is sit down. not the person to be training people. Yeah, I don't know. I don't hate Dean. I don't hate I, Dean in the way I hate Dean Gary. Dean is on a an ascending trajectory. Yeah, Dean is just... Character arc-wise. I, I don't think Dean has the wherewithal to be aware of his impact. I think Dean is just happy to be of use. Right. And I don't think Dean necessarily thinks through all the implications. I think he's just happy to be in charge of someone. But he's not self-centered yeah it's not he's not deliberately malicious he's just ignorant yes yeah and willing to be educated he's also willing to be um led around to be told what to do yeah and i think that's dean dean to me just feels like a neutral entity he is clay to be shaped he is not villainous in the way that gary is villainous fucking gary Fucking Gary. Fucking Gary. Especially this episode. Oh, God. I almost Somebody's threw up. Somebody's fucking Gary. Ooh, don't. <laughs> Please don't. I can't. Okay. So they're getting a stamped card for having attended today. And Kieran's like, what happens and when Kieran, I get all the stamps? Kieran calling bullshit on this whole thing. Yeah, he goes, what happens when I get all the stamps? And he's like, oh. You well, get then to you fill have up- all the stamps. Yeah, and you get to fill up another card. And if you fill up all six cards, you get a day off to the seaside. And Karen's like, hey. oh, God. A fun day trip. <laughs> six stamps and you get a day trip. So what's that, like every two months? Because I think every card has like six to eight stamps on it. More than that, I was, my recollection is something, it looked like two weeks worth or yeah. more. Yeah. So Kieran's basically like, this is bullshit. He knows Probably it's bullshit. Probably each card is a fortnight. Could be two weeks. Yeah. But Jam is back on patrols because her mom is sitting there untangling bunting for the village fate. And she is sewing a new ribbon. On her vest because it's time for her to start patrolling again, and her mom's and like, "And this is the replacement oh. for the HVF." Yeah, which band. we're going to find out about at the very important meeting. Yeah, this is a replacement for the armband. She's 
And her mom's like, oh, I thought we were, um, I really thought we were all done with that. And Jim's like, oh, no, it's a new thing that started up again. This is giving Jim context. Jim doesn't want to give this up. This is purpose. This is a safe space. This is a safe. This is something that's familiar. She knows about it. She knows how to operate in this space. This space, space makes sense to her. This is what she did during her formative years. And this yep. is what she wants to keep doing. And now that Gary gave her a super hot bracelet, and Gary's going to be the one driving her around, this is uh, this is starting to look pretty pretty good <laughs> but then philip is on his way to work and he feels the call of ishtar <laughs> he's like do i have time hmm. do yeah, I, think, I, I, I have think enough I could, time i think i could get one in i think i really could and so he goes over to the brothel and goes in <clears throat> oh to be a single young man living with your mother at, with no expenses. Oh, so you can afford this so sex worker So all of your money time. is disposable income. Yeah. Well, he goes and he goes back to be with fake Amy. Um, on his way to work. And remember last time there was a woman with a camera? Well, she's back. And she's still filming. And this time she's taking notes about who comes and goes. Yep. And then Kieran is getting ready to leave. We're hopping around as much this episode as we did last episode because we still have all of these disparate. Right. But we're tying up some loose happening. ends. Yeah. Oh, we're kind of. I don't know. We're, you we're, know at least, we're at least like significantly progressing plot lines. Yeah. Nothing felt like it was left dangling. Everything felt like we were moving forward through the plot line. So at this point, Kieran is getting ready to leave. And his mom's like, well, are you coming back? We're having like a special Sunday lunch, a family dinner. We're having a special family Bring dinner. Bring someone. Bring somebody. And his dad's like, oh, you're getting an early start at work? And he's like, dad, it's not a start if it's not going anywhere. Like he's getting paid. Yeah. And he's, like he's up for promotion. Right. And his his dad's like, oh, so like regular work then. Ha, 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 ha. Ho, 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 ho. No, no, it's not. No, it's not the same. And poor Philip has fallen asleep. Whatever he did with fake Amy must have been um, satisfying in a way that uh, allowed him to drift off into a dreamless sleep. And uh, maybe, probably, he's going to miss the VIM, the very important meeting. And then we cut back to Simon, our PDS Charles Manson. <laughs> Matt's taking a selfie. I'm, I'm trying. If you just do the regular camera, it will work. Yeah, I'll do that. Yeah. <laughs> Switch it around. Come on. Come on. I can do this. Huh. Oh, it auto zoomed out. What? So we go back to our PDS Charles Manson, Charlie Manson, with his increasing number of uh, avid followers. Mm, He's looking yeah. a little cult leader. He really is. He's and you know, given off that vibe. You know what I think is most unsettling about Simon's character is up until now, he's been very two-dimensional. He, yeah, it's been he very is, obvious what he's up to. Yeah, he is as two-dimensional as the vicar was. This element of chaos in the plot that is forcing the other characters to sort of swirl around it without having any real dimension itself. Right. He's he's a node in the plot. And I do think we remedy that this episode, for which I'm very thankful. But up till this point... No, Simon is just this, like, looming thundercloud on the horizon. Right. All of the signals, the the most nuanced thing that he's been doing is sending signals to Kieran. Yeah. That he's interested in, in him. Right. Which, because he's not... In a relationship not, kind of Because way. he's not a three-dimensional character, feel contrived. Right. Feel manipulative. But then he actually does something that would undermine 
his other activities. Right. He does get to mention this episode, but we're not yeah. there yet. Because right now, he's getting everybody to tell their rising stories as an effort to Because he's free doing the them. same thing that Maxine is doing. Right. Because we are all looking for who was the first risen in Rorton. And since every single giant fucking neon sign is pointing at Kieran, my guess is it is not Kieran. That is a very skeptical perspective, honey. Well, I am a very skeptical person, you are. honey, and I'm often right. So this is where I'm going to hang my hat and we will see if I'm right or if I'm not right. But this meeting is happening. This very important meeting is also happening. So Charlie Simon Manson is having his PDS meeting. But Maxine is also having her meeting. And this meeting is progressing without a certain Philip. Ooh, yes, we've focused on Philip's chair. Yes. Quite significantly. And what they are announcing at this meeting is the creation of the Rorton Protection Services, which is just the Human Volunteer Force with, with another name. With different funding. It's basically like when a Karen asks for the manager and you just turn around for a second and then turn back and you're like, okay, how can I help you? This is the acronym equivalent of that. It is not the HVF. <laughs> it is now the RPS, the rebrand of the HVF. And they are going to set up a community watch, but also a reporting service. So if you see something, say something. Like they say at the airport. If you see something, say something. Right, but in a more nefarious context. Yeah. Because immediately somebody's like, well, should we say something about that brothel then? The PDS brothel? And Maxine's like, what? I'm sorry, what the fuck? Can you please repeat that? The living with the dead? <sighs> she is as grossed out about that as we are about Gary and Jim, which is saying something. And the recording lady, oh, they mentioned the brothel at the meeting. And then Philip comes out. Philip wakes up and he's like, oh, shit. Oh, shit. I'm Why didn't late. you wake me up? And she's like, well, you were sleeping so peacefully. And he's like, God damn it. So he runs to leave and the recording lady is there and she spits in his face. And she's like, your reckoning is at hand. I'm going to get you. And he's like, oh, shit. So he runs off to go to the meeting. Um, and dirt, meanwhile, the meeting is still going on, and Maxine is stirring up the living. Her mask is slipping big time. It's desperation days for Maxine. Whatever she needs to have happen, she needs to have it happen. So now she's been laying the seeds. She's been getting her fingers into all of the aspects of the town. And now it's time to start Really calling everybody, frothing everyone up against the PDS and Rorton. And that's what she's doing. And in the midst of all that, poor Henry Lonsdale's mother stands up. And she's like, but what about Henry? What about my son? My son is missing and none of you give a shit. You can't even muster the energy to pretend to give a shit that my son is missing. What if it was your son? What if it was your child and no one cared and no one was looking and no one would even admit that he ran, that he didn't run away, that something happened to him. And Maxine is behind her and she's like, we all know Henry's missing voluntarily. He left to go to a recruitment thing or whatever. And Henry Lonsdale's mother is like, every word out of your mouth is a motherfucking lie. And I don't want to hear it. You are poison. And I don't want to hear one more word out of your mouth. I mean, credit to Henry Lonsdale's mother. She could have been. They were setting her up to be this volatile but ineffective character we were talking about how henry was telepathic henry had powers she was being set up as this hysteric but ultimately unreliable unreliable character and we have really shaped her into like a guilt a force for guilt a force for saying out loud the quiet part the 
He is still a child. He is missing. And just because of what he is, you all don't care. And that makes you guys the monster, not him. And ultimately, she gets silenced. Because the tidal wave of hate is too high. And we cut back to Simon and Kieran. And Simon and Kieran are having a talk after the meeting because Simon just wrapped up his meeting. And Kieran has matured in a way that I am 100% in support. Totally. We yes. have gone from a character that could not say what he thought to save his life to being able to communicate effectively his feelings to everyone around him. And I am 100% behind this because he's like, listen, Simon, you could be cool. You could be so much. You could be amazing. But this whole Messiah bullshit you've got going on, it's not great. It's not a good look on you. And I don't like it. And Simon's like, this isn't a deliberate mask. I don't have this. This isn't a mask. This is who I am. He's like, it's a mask. And I know it's a mask. And it's not working on me. And I don't like it. Please stop. Please stop. Whatever this conversion thing you're trying on me right now, it's not working. It's making me want hate you and I want to leave. And Simon's like, I I'm sorry. Like, I don't know that I'm doing it. I'm not doing that on purpose. I'm just trying to be with you. And he's like, well, then you need to figure out who you are when you're not the guy in front of everybody giving the sermons. And once you figure that out, I'll be with that guy, but I'm not going to be with the other guy. And so Simon's like, heard. Thank you, Karen. I, I hear will you. try things your way. Yeah, I, I hear you. what you are saying. I, I get it. I have wrapped my entire persona up in being this disciple of the prophet, the undead prophet. And I have forgotten who I am without the context of the undead prophet. And I understand that. And they are about to embrace over this moment of mutual realization when Amy shows up. And she's like, oh, hi. You guys you, are not. You guys are not allowed to argue. Yeah. You're my best. You're both my friends. You're not allowed to argue. You have to get along. And she's in there to get something. But the jar she's holding is already full. Their apple cider jar is already full. So he's like, what are you in here for? Your jar's full. And he's, she's like, oh. My gosh. You just refilled that half an hour ago. I'm so sorry. I didn't I didn't even realize. And she leaves. And again, Kieran is the character I wanted him to be because he's like, listen, Simon, I don't want Amy to find out because she walks in on us kissing. I wanna tell her. I wanna to, I wanna to sit down and talk to her because she's my friend. And I, I don't want this to be something that comes between us. I want this to be something that becomes a thing that's mutual understanding. And so I'm not going to do this right now because I need to tell Amy first. Right. Where Amy wants the three of them to be friends long right. term. Yeah. Kieran also wants the three of them to be friends long term. Right. And so he's looking forward to the future as like, I can't give up the friend I already have. For the boy toy that I think I'm going to really like. Like, I'm not sacrificing my friendships for you. Which is the sign of healthy emotional maturity. That this is going to hurt Amy. And I want to make the hurt as low as possible. I can't take away the hurt because she believes a lie. And that's not on me. That's on Simon. But I'm going to be the one that lets her down easy. And I think that's really mature of him. There's no better way to go around this. Except, I mean, he could avoid Simon entirely, but then we're in a noble idiot situation. Right. And that doesn't... Because Simon's never going to be with Amy, so he'd be giving Simon up for nothing. Right. You can be in the noble idiot situation, or you can be in the cheap conflict because close people are hiding things from each other. Right. And I think it's very notable that this show very rarely falls back on the cheap conflict. Just like the previous episode where we could have made Amir the bad guy and we didn't make Amir the bad guy. Right. It's really easy to drive viewer sympathy for Freddy by making Amir despicable. But instead, you create a situation where it's like, these are real people. They're making real choices. You don't have to feel strongly about one character or the other. 
You don't have to feel like Freddy's the bad guy. You don't have to feel like a feel like a mirror's the bad guy because in a lot of real life situations there are no bad guys. There's misunderstandings, there's miscommunications, but there's nobody actively trying to be a bad person. And if there is, that's a totally different interaction. That's an entirely different. That's a horse of another color. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But we go back to Philip because Philip has arrived late, so late. He missed the very important meeting. It's all over, Philip. But he ends up getting off because... <laughs> not like that. He ends up getting away with it because Maxine thinks he missed the meeting because he promised his mother he would talk about Henry Lonsdale at the meeting. And so she thinks it was a clever way of him avoiding having to deal with the Henry Lonsdale problem. It wasn't. He was off hanging with fake Amy, but Philip's like, whoosh, dodge that bullet. Until Maxine is like, I am authorizing you to be aware of sensitive information. And I have a source that has seen Henry at a recruiting camp for the undead liberation army. And I want you to tell Henry Lonsdale's mother that you've seen him there. I don't remember her phrasing it quite so carefully. Yeah. She's definitely implying that I am making this shit up on the fly. And you are to parrot what I say to the Lonsdale family. Yeah. To get them to shut up. Yeah. Here's what I want you to tell them. Right. I want you to tell Henry Lonsdale's mother... That I had a source who saw him at a training camp. And Philip's like, okay, who's the source? And Maxine's like, like, no, 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 you misunderstand me. You don't know what we're actually talking about here. And Philip's like, who is the source, Maxine? And Maxine's like, Philip, I thought you wanted to be in politics. Why aren't you you picking up on this quicker? I'm putting it down. I need you to pick it up. And Philip's like, I don't want to pick it up. It's dirty and it's gross and it's going to get me dirty. And I want to leave it right where you said it. And Which she's like, kudos to Philip. I knew I was going to like Philip. I mean, fuck Gary. There were there were two potential plot lines for Philip. Yeah. One was the the sheep who just quietly does whatever he's told to do. Right. And he becomes a an easily despisable character. Another Gary. Another Gary. Yeah. But a um like Gary is still proactive. Yeah. In pursuing what he wants. But this plot line for Philip would be he doesn't even do what he wants. Right. He's only there to for other people to push around. Right. And the other plot line for Philip is for him to have some principles and for him to remain the kind of innocent, naive character. I just want to change the world politics. Yeah. Yeah. And he actually tells her there are limits, aren't there? Like there is a line, isn't there? And she just says, Philip, I thought you wanted to get ahead. I thought you understood what I was trying to do here. And she gives him, she's like, listen, we're having a protest at the brothel. You have until you meet me here to go to the protest to get your shit together and decide whose side you are on. And that gives you five hours. So go home, think about it, decide where you fall. And And the implication is, if you side with me, your political career will continue. And if you don't, it won't. I'll ruin you. Yeah. And then we go back to Gary and Jim, and they're flirting, and I can't even talk about it. It's so gross. So fucking gross. But then we go to the crazy blonde PDS lady. She was the one who was talking to Freddie in the previous episode. Right. And she's basically like, I'm going to make Simon proud. I'm going to do it. 
and whoever she guy, guy that guy she's that, with. The guy that she's with is the one who Simon was really pushing on when Kieran showed up earlier. Yeah. And he was skeptical about Simon and about the things Simon was talking about. Right. And about the the real improvement in either quality of life or experience or whatever that would come from you know cleaning off the makeup right and so he's like wait this isn't a good idea but i'm still here with you because you're important to me but i i'm politely disagreeing with you right and then we have a moment after that where Philip has gone to Lamb, the lady's name is Lamb, Miss Lamb, and she's he's going to try to get the tapes, but Maxine has beat him to it. And so Maxine's like, yes, please, get those tapes together. I'll be back later to pick them up. So happy to see you. Talk to you later. And Philip's like, shit. And then we cut back to Jem and Gary, and they are on patrol. And they are on patrol in the woods where they, where she killed Henry. And where he burned and buried Henry's body. And when she gets out of the car, her pants are about to fall off. Did anybody else notice that? They're bizarrely low. Yeah. Her jeans. I don't. It's like they were like, well, she's only going to wear this. It was either a a mishap or a costume flop. Well, she's got some kind of like heavy vest on. And I think uh, the vest or the gun belt that she's wearing was pushing her jeans down so she's probably so tiny they couldn't really find a good size jeans for her and then it was only going to be such a small amount of time it's like an equilibrium at the very end when he's got the sword on his belt Mm -hmm. and the sword's not actually attached to his belt he's literally just holding it at his hip because the amount of screen time that it was going to get wasn't worth the effort of attaching it to the belt are all just cosmetic yeah But they're going on patrol in these woods. And Jem's like, I can split up. It's fine. I'm like, I'm a badass. Well, yeah. She she volunteers to split up. Right. Because they can cover more territory that way. And you kind of want to like Gary because he's being really attentive and nice. But at the same time, he's being attentive and nice about patrolling and killing people. (sighs) And he's still, you know what? I'm still fucking Gary. I'm still team fuck Gary. Yeah. I, I am. I really am. Because she loses it. She loses her shit. She thinks she sees Henry's dead body. She screams. She falls on the ground. And he shows up and he's right there and he's like, it's okay. It's okay. It's all right. And then he takes her out for a drink to help her calm down. And then some people volunteer to pay for their drinks. So yeah. they get loaded. So what we're doing is rewinding to a time. When they were HVF and they were important and people respected them and treated them like heroes. Yep. Yep. And what do you get when you self-identify as a hero? Okay. To quote Hobie, a.k.a. Spider-Punk from Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. I'm not a hero because calling yourself a hero makes you a self-mythologizing narcissistic autocrat. Fuck Gary. Yeah, that's exactly. And fuck yeah, Hobie. And fuck yeah, Hobie. Fuck yeah, have, Hobie. Have, have you seen Across the Spider-Verse? Who's me? your favorite character in Across the Spider-Verse? Are you asking me? And why is it Hobie? <laughs> like, I've not seen it. You know I haven't seen it. Oh, you're asking the universe in I'm, general. I'm asking okay, the, yes. the viewers. The yeah, listeners. Fine. Go on our Instagram. Comment on any post. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and then we get a really, at this point, honestly, I am living for the Amy Phillip interactions. I mean, the rest well, of it's okay. interesting. The so rest the, of it's good. The Amy Phillip relationship is still hanging on which direction is the Phillip character going? Right. Is he going to, like, cave on his principles yeah. to... Per, um, is he going to cave on his personal principles simply to progress his political career? Or is he going to hit that line that he mentioned to Maxine yeah. and hold it? And hold the line. 
Which is he going to do? So I if I la- didn't know which way this was going to go. No. If last episode was Freddy's Day of Reckoning, this episode is Philip's. This is Philip's episode. Other stuff is happening. But this episode is about Philip. Because Philip is now the one whose whole life hinges on a decision. On a single decision. Whose side is he on? He loves Amy. He thinks he loves. He loves the idea of Amy. He also loves the idea of being in politics. And ultimately, at the end of the day, which one will he choose? Not that giving a, he has to give up politics, but in the immediate future, right. it's a his, short-term loss. He's He's got his foot in the door with yeah. politics. And Maxine implies that if he cooperates with her, things will go well for him. Right. He does not have his foot in the door with Amy. He had his foot in the door with Amy in season one. Right. And then and he then was like, don't tell anybody. He pulled his I foot back. You. Yeah. And well, he kicked her and then he pulled his foot back. Yes. Yeah. And all of his interactions with Amy so far this season have been negative. Right. So we're kind of projecting this. Uh, they're doing a very good job of projecting this uncertainty about what decision is Philip going to make. Right. And we really are. But in this moment, like Amy is there seeing Philip's mom about her symptoms because her symptoms have continued. And she gives her a new neurotriptyline plus, which it turns out is not actually that different than neurotriptyline regular. It's Um, just got some anti-anxiety. Yeah, it's not as anxiety inducing and it leads to better sleep and blah, blah, blah. But it has basically the same ingredients. And then they hear Philip cussing because Philip has burned himself on the toaster. And Amy has a Because fun- he's so consumed with this life choice. He's at a... Uh, crossroads. Yeah, he's at a crossroads. Yeah. And he's, his attention is consumed by which direction is he going to go. Right, and because- he's just trying to get... His toast to stay in the toaster, and the toaster is not cooperating. <laughs> and so he uses the percussive trustable shooting method and hits it. Hits it. Yeah. And then burns himself. And burns himself. And his mom and Amy show up at the door, and his mom's like, um, Philip, UK. And Amy's like, I get like that about my clock radio. I had a clock radio once, and I let it get out of line, and, you know, It didn't last long. Yeah, I had to hit it, and then I had to leave it alone for long periods of time during the day. (laughs) 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 And then we cut back to Simon and Kieran, because Simon... And I I think this moment was a little bit endearing to Amy, because since, since Philip kicked her and she closed the door... Yeah. Every time she's interacted with Philip, he has had this mask up right. with the intention of impressing her. Right. And this was a very and real this, Philip moment. Yes. Yeah. She got to see the real Philip. Right. For a moment. Yes. And that was, oh, like it was nice to get a sneak peek behind the mask of anybody. Right. Yeah. But in particular, this person that you use at one point you had a relationship with. She was attracted to him enough to not have a relationship necessarily, but to have a physical moment with him. And so maybe there is some potential there. And we haven't been exploring it, but I think this opens the door a little bit. But we immediately cut to Simon and Kieran. And Simon is putting on makeup for Kieran. Because Kieran invited him over. For, for Sunday fancy lunch. lunch. Yep. And as they're leaving, they share a kiss because Kieran is thankful to Simon for compromising on this. Yes. So that he, he could do he something that Kieran... recognizes the sacrifice that yeah. Simon is making. Yeah, because this was important to Kieran and Simon was willing to not tow his party line for just a minute so that he could share this moment with Kieran in a way that made it meaningful for Kieran. Right. And Amy sees them 
kissing. Right. And as I, careful as they have been yeah. to not let Amy see them, it's they're just walking through town. Yeah. And Amy happens to be at the same road. Yeah. Just down the road. And I at think this, intersection. this really puts to bed the idea that Amy was complicit in this. I think she really thought that Simon loved her. Or at least that there was a potential for Simon to eventually love her. She right. knows Kieran won't because she knows Kieran's not attracted to women. And so there's that tension is not there for her. She can just enjoy their friendship. Right. It's it's the will and grace tension. Right. But she didn't know Simon. She didn't know Simon would fancy Kieran over her. Let's put it that way. And so she's, she's I mean, she's quietly upset about it. But with a lot of um, maturity, not screaming, not yelling at everyone, but just like, dang, there's a missed opportunity. I guess I'm not going to get that one. Now who will love me? Kind of a thing. And then we go to Philip at Mrs. Lamb's and he talks his way in the door. She's the woman, remember, that was filming him going in and out of the PDS brothel. Right. Who he grew up next door to. Well, no, this is Mrs. Lamb. This is the different lady. He grew up next to Henry Lonsdale's mother. Oh, that's right. Yeah. And so he's like visualizing killing her. He's looking at all the things that he could use to kill her. They do a really good job of conveying what his attention is focused on in the room. And it's all items that have a lot of weight. Yeah. And would be good blunt instruments. Right. And he does end up exiting with the tapes. And for a moment. We think he's killed her. But no, really, he told her he was trying to convert the people in there. He was doing outreach. Yes. When it's like two to three minutes later, we cut to his mom and Mrs. Lamb shows up and just starts blathering to Philip's mom about how good and sweet Philip is. And she really appreciates his efforts to redeem the lost or whatever. And here's another moment where we really could have had a character be willfully ignorant. And I really think Philip's mom knows what's going on with Philip 100%, 100% of the time. Oh, yeah. She knows he's been going to the brothel. She picks up on that right away and she absolutely does not judge him for it. She's like, he needed connections because and he found it. she sees the PDS sufferers as actual people. Right. She interacts with them on a more intimate level than pretty much anybody else in this town. Right, but she doesn't judge him for seeing a sex worker. She doesn't nope. judge him for going to the PDS broth, that, that they're PDS. None of it. None of it invokes any kind of a judgment from her. It's just like, oh, that's what Philip's been up to. I can see why given his I don't know, position in the membership in this town, yeah, he doesn't quite fit in with the machismo right you know, club that you normally almost require to you know have some kind of physical relationship with an intimate partner. Right. Right. And so he's very much excluded from a lot of that, that like a teenager would get. Yeah. And okay, now here's, here's this opportunity for him to actually explore that and have a physical intimate connection with somebody. Yes. And good on him for doing that. And I like that none of her acceptance is the performative type of acceptance where she doesn't confront Philip. She's not like, I know what you've been doing, Philip, and I'm okay with it. Right. She just leaves open the opportunity that if he ever wanted to discuss it, he could. But she doesn't force the discussion on him right. when he's and not we ready. We see some emotional bids from her yeah. to invite him to talk about things. Right, but when he doesn't, she doesn't press the matter. Because uh, okay. when you're truly accepting of somebody... It's not a performance. It doesn't require that they know you are accepting them. Right. You you don't you communicate need them. the invitation. Right. But the other half of that interaction is up to the person that you're right. inviting. Right. They are not there for you to check a box. 
They are not there. Your acceptance is not like a form you're filling out that that you get to check all the boxes and then you get a gold star. You just do it as part of being a kind human being. And that also recognizes the agency and emotional maturity of all of the people around you, including the people that you are, quote, accepting. So the fact that Philip required anything for her to accept it, she doesn't put any of that emotional burden off on Philip. Right. She doesn't outsource any of that to him. She internalizes all of that is like, I see Philip for who he is. I accept him for who he is. I don't need anything further than right. that. Right. I have conveyed an invitation for him to reciprocate. Right. He, for him to disclose that to me. Yes. When he, as an autonomous, sovereign individual, decides that he wants to communicate that to me. Yeah. And and that's the box to check. Right. I have done my part in inviting someone into a reciprocal relationship. Right. Into a, a disclosure of you know private information, but I'm not pushing that. Yeah, I'm not pressuring them into feeling like they have to. In right. order to earn my acceptance. Yeah. Yeah. And in stark contrast to that, we get to our singularly most awkward and difficult section of the entire episode. And that is when Kieran takes Simon to Sunday lunch. I and really, at first, I really like this scene. Oh, this scene was tough. This scene, there was so much tension here oh, and my they God. just pulled it off it was so fucking good because simon and karen are there they're eating with their parents his parents and jem arrives at home and jem has brought a well, guest hold on. even before jem arrives yeah you can tell how hard simon is trying yes to fit yes. in for kieran this added all of the nuance that we needed in this character. If we had a two-dimensional character in this episode at all, if it you was were Simon. at all skeptical yeah. about how dedicated Simon was to convincing Kieran that he was all in for Kieran, yeah, this was it. This was it because this he, should get rid of all of the skepticism, right? All of the criticisms that Kieran made earlier about how Simon couldn't turn off is Charlie Simon Manson persona. He is trying to turn it off. He's trying to just be personable, to have a moment. He compliments Kieran's dad's jeans. He wears the makeup. He's sitting at the table. He is he is doing all of the things that he needs to do to make Kieran feel like he is trying to support the way of life that Kieran has chosen. And that is when we get Jim and her guest. Fucking Gary. Fucking Gary. And Gary is on peak fucking behavior. Because first, they're making out outside, which is so and fucking gross. they're pretty drunk. And they're pretty drunk. And they walk in to this room and sit down at this table. And now we have two members of the HBF, now the RPS, and two PDS sufferers and these poor parents. And everyone at first is just trying to act like it's all okay. Right. Kieran's parents have the normal level of, I am bullshitting myself to, I'm bullshitting myself that everything, everything's great. Everything is as it always has been. The family dynamic is going good. Whatever. They they have like skill level two yeah. out of ten on maintaining the level of interactions amongst the family members. And occasionally Jem kind of tosses things up to a level three. Right. And then Gary and Jem come in and suddenly it's like level eight. Right. Because Gary immediately starts sharing a funny story about this time that he and Jem killed a bunch of pds with like 
whatever right. was Gary in the bathroom. gushing about how much of a badass Jem is. And how she shot all these dudes in the head with a cult. And, and stabbed a guy through the oh. eye with a pole. Matt literally was watching this and he goes, wow, Gary. Like, oh my God, what is happening? This is so hard to watch. And then when Gary finally wraps it up, Kieran's like, I got a story. I would like to tell a story from my own perspective. Yeah, you get to talk about the war. I get to talk about the war. At the same uncomfortable uncomfortability level yeah. as you just told. And this is, oh my God, chef's Perfect. Kiss. Perfect. Kieran has absolutely matured in the way that I, as a viewer, and I, as someone who, if I had created this character and they growed in this way, I would feel like I had peaked. This is perfection. Mother fucking perfection. Because he gets the opportunity to answer Gary, and he does. He's like, when I first woke he up, it was all dark. He responds in kind and overdoes it. Yeah. He's like, let me tell but you about a, when I woke in up. In a righteous way. Right. And he tells him about, like, I woke up, and at first it was dark. And I didn't know what was happening. And I didn't know where I was. And then I realized I was in and a And it coffin. was rain. And I, like, I yeah. crawled, I clawed my way out. And I finally got above ground. And all I heard was the clock chiming midnight. And it was just me. And the rain was falling and I was hungry. And there was nobody else around. And I was so hungry. And I was just ready to get started. And the dad's like, Kieran. And he's like, what? Oh, Gary gets to st share his funny stories, but I don't get to share my stories, Dad? Fuck you. And Simon's like, wait, Karen, can you tell me the hot part about how you were all alone when you woke up again? <laughs> <Just> like, <laughs> <laughs> He's like... About how ding, you ding, were ding, the ding, first ding. risen. Yeah. Oh, can, can we talk about that again? Can, can you tell me the part about how you were alone and it was just the clock timing and it was raining and there was nobody there? Because I think I found the first reason. And he's so excited. But honestly, this was a moment for Kieran because he was like, you all are pretending like this is okay. You all are, are all pretending like shit hasn't hit the motherfucking fan and it is spraying directly in my face and nobody else's. And I am tired of it. I'm tired of you telling me that if I go every day to the PDS scheme, I'm going to have management potential. I'm tired of you comparing this to your job like it's in any way equivalent and like I'm not actually physically enslaved. I'm tired of you all pretending like I didn't want to go and have a better life and that chance was taken away from me. And I'm tired of you pretending like this thing between Jem and Gary is okay because you think Gary's an okay guy because of what he did during the war and I'm fucking tired of it and I'm leaving. And he does. Mic drop. <laughs> He's like, I am done. And I loved that moment. Loved that moment. And meantime, some other shit has been hitting the fan. Because Maxine went back home to the B&B &B lady. And she was trying to watch a video that Mrs. Lamb had recorded for her. And wouldn't you know, the episode she was trying to watch cuts off in the middle Oh, and there's something recorded over oh, it. Because she recorded something over it. So even though Philip got all those tapes, he missed one. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. And guess who's on the tape? I'll give Philip. you two guesses. Philip. And also, crazy PDS lady Zoe, the blonde lady with the beanie, and her sidekick have gone to the clinic and freed the PDS sufferers who were stuck in the cage. And they set off the alarm, and just as they're leaving, the nurse lady arrives on her bike. And I thought this was really interesting, because when she walks in there, one of them is using the spray can. Yes. Yeah. So we are like... One of them is holding oh, the spray mindless can. How mindless are they? Well, are hold they? on. They've they've been given neurotriptyline. The, the doctor mentioned before... That they are sedated until the neurotriptyline starts taking effect. Oh, okay. So they're waiting for... So they've been getting their neurotriptyline doses gotcha. for, I don't know, two, maybe three days. Yeah, however long it's been. Right. Yeah, because that, that one guy brought in and I get the feeling that's probably when, like a yeah. couple weeks. Yeah, because that one guy brought got brought in when Kieran was at the clinic last time. Yeah. Yeah, not the time that he came, but before the PDS scheme. Yeah. 
So I don't know. Anyway, nurse lady got killed. She was, oops. Oof. Not great. Not great. And it was because of Simon's followers. So not great. So after that amazingly awkward exchange between Gary and Jim and Kieran oh, and, and Simon. I, I really liked how Kieran's mom got up to go get something from the kitchen. And then his dad was like, I'll, I'll just give her a hand. And then Simon, Simon's mask drops. Yeah. He locks eyes with Gary and he's like, let's keep it civil while we're here. Yeah. Let's Okay. Not- so I don't have to take you down again. <laughs> and Gary's, and like, Gary's like, uh, okay. Cool. It's cool. Maybe that's why Gary did the dick measuring thing. Because Simon was right, like, let's because, keep it chill. Because once the parents were around, yeah. then he knew Simon was trying to keep it on the level. Right. He recognized a, a place. He recognized a situation where he could reassert his dominance. Right. Where he could break the expectations in a safe way. Yeah. In a way him. that he thought wasn't going to get him, wasn't going to blow back on him. But I don't think he thought Kieran was going to do what he did. Right. I don't and think, I think Kieran keeps yeah. breaking everyone's expectations because this whole time Kieran has been the overly sensitive kid who just like runs away from his problems. Right. I mean, he ran away in the most you can run away. Right? Exactly. Yeah. And so he has that reputation. Yeah. But Kieran can could not give a shit. About his <laughs> reputation at this point. No. He's gone. He's, he's done with grown that. beyond that. Right. And then we get to Philip has finally re arrived back at the Civic Center because his time is up and he's got to tell Maxine what he's decided. And Maxine's like, funny story. I watched a really interesting video earlier. Let me show you. Let me show you. So she puts the video on and it's Philip going into the. Well, at brothel. first, it's the end of the Mr. Er, it's part of the mystery episode yeah. and then it like fuzzes out they they've like photoshopped this af- afterward but it's okay it's, <laughs> it, it it's fuzzes okay. out yeah. and switches to oh it's here's a camera view of the sidewalk interesting and so maxine's like well given given this new information i think um i think you're about to go tell henry lonsdale's mother all about the source the secret source that told you where Henry is, aren't you? And Philip's like, I guess. So basically, she's and, going to blackmail Philip. But she keeps laying it on. And then, I really expect to see you at the protest tonight. And maybe you'll have a few words to say yeah. at the protest. Yeah. How much else are you going to give me? How much else am I going to be able to get out of this? Because... Right. How badly do you want to I'm, hold on I'm to I'm just going to keep dropping hints. Right. And then I'm going to pay attention tonight and see how much you work to fulfill those hints that I've dropped. Right. Yep. And then we cut to Amy. Amy's at the graveyard seeing her nan's grave because she really just had kind of a shock. She had a moment. She had something happen and she doesn't have we know anyone. She, she has a history of... Going to her nan's grave. Right. And, and just talking. Honestly, she doesn't have anybody else. She doesn't right. have a family in the way that Kieran did. She only had her nan and her nan and died we, the year after we, she did. Yeah, we paused it here. They all died in the year 2009. Yep. And we can see the date on her grandma's tombstone. And we thought, oh no, like how close. Did her grandma die to the cutoff? And and it was like July six months later. It's July of 2010. So she died after Amy, but not so close that they rose together. Like seven months after. Which is really sad. But she hears the protest at the brothel and she ends up meandering over there. And that's how we get her over to the brothel because she needs to be there for the next scene that's about to happen. And in the meantime... Philip has gone to see Mrs. Lonsdale. Yeah, and Mrs. Lonsdale is like, Philip doesn't even say anything. This is why this show is so good, okay? The fact that these characters are all awake 
They are all aware, and yet we are still able to progress the plot forward is fucking amazing. We have not relied on any kind of cheap narrative conflict in the way that I was expecting us to. Right. Because we, Philip We have the grown-up who, grew, uh, who, as a child, lived next door to this lady. Yeah. And, and now here he is. Full grown, getting into politics. He's doing all the political bullshit, whatever. But she's like, we're going to cut through that bullshit. I know you. Yeah. I know. I've seen you your entire life. Literally. I've been watching you from my window. <laughs> <laughs> well, we do. You and know. Yeah. I know. You never went along with any of that performative macho BS that all of your peers did. You never participated in any of that because your values are so important to you. Right. You're a serious, you were always a serious little boy. Right. What she that says. line is still there. That line that you mentioned earlier, Philip. Right. And I'm making you look at that line right now. Yep. And I'm asking you to stand on my side of the line. Yep. And and then we cut it off. Well, she tells him, listen, I know what you're here to tell me. I know what Maxine wants you to do. And what you're going to do is give me false hope. If you tell me he's at a training camp, then you're telling me he's still alive. And I don't believe that's the case. I think that hope is cruel. Giving me situation. hope is cruel in this situation. Because the only reason Maxine would be working so hard to tell me that Henry wasn't, was alive and to get me to quit looking for him was if he was dead. So I just have to accept that he's gone and that there's nothing that anyone's going to do about it because of what he was. Maybe it's Mrs. Lonsdale. That's a psychic. Maybe. Because Philip doesn't even have to say anything. She just pats the couch and he sits well, next we, to her. We cut it off, yep. maintaining the ambiguity of the choice that Philip is going to make. And she, he tells her, all I need is, she tells him, all I need is some truth. All I've been hearing are lies. And all I want you to do is tell me the truth. Right. Can you do that, Philip? Right. And at this point, Philip could then, you know, play along yeah. with this sincerity, this invitation that Mrs. Lonsdale is giving him. And if he, like, executes it well, he could say, yeah, he's at the training camp. Right. And Mrs. Lonsdale could believe him. And if he does it that cements his political career success. Yep. Or he says, you're right. Like all of your intuitions are correct. Maybe you are the secretly psychic. Seek, blah, 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 blah. Maybe you are the secretly psychic Lonsdale. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's where Henry got it from. Yeah. And, but, but if he makes that choice as the serious child that Mrs. Lonsdale has always perceived him to be, he won't be able to hide that decision from himself like he has been. Yep. And he's going to have to follow the alternative path. Right. And, and so we still leave it ambiguous yeah. up until he's walking up to the brothel. Which is good. The show does a good job of that, of cutting you off at a moment where you they're, don't feel... They're really maintaining the narrative tension. Yeah, you don't feel contrived, but it definitely keeps the tension going through the episode. Because then we are back at the brothel, and they have raided it, and they're bringing all the employees out, and everyone's shouting and at the them. And the clients. And the clients and everybody. And everybody's shouting, and Philip arrives... And Philip goes in front of them with the megaphone and he says, and I thought this was really interesting, is we need to stop pretending that we were ever pure. 
And maybe we have to pretend that they're bad so that we can pretend that we're good. Wow, can you hit that home harder? Want me to repeat that? Maybe we have to pretend that they are bad so that we can pretend that we are good. Simply put, but a profound idea. Maybe we need a villain so we can pretend we're the heroes. Come on in, Frankenstein's monster. I mean, wow. Nice moment, Philip. And Amy is like, oh. Mm, he's kind of sexy when he's... Uh Hi, Speaking Philip. to his oh, truth. <laughs> I didn't again. I hadn't recognized you under that mask you've been wearing. And in the end, I mean they're jeering, they're not listening to him. He's trying to convince them that they're being they're being the pad guys, and they're just not listening. And so he just goes up and he gets in line with the clients. Like, you can't actually blackmail me if everybody knows I did it. Right. Suck it, Maxine. Um, who was it I was telling you about? There's a character I was telling you. Oh, in uh, Brandon Sanderson's Stormlight Archive, there was the character Dalinar. I showed yeah. you a video, like, clip meme about Dalinar. Yeah. And how, you know, he chose his... Oh, his... What was it? His honor? His honor, yes. Oh, like, Dalinar has a nice butt, right? <laughs> but also his honor, <laughs> yeah. yes. Like, what... Oh, yeah, it was... What's the best thing about Dalinar Colin? Yeah. And it was like something and then his butt and then they hand it to the other person and then the other person writes a third checkbox and it's like his honor, but then they check his butt. Yeah. Yeah. And where in the story, Dalinar is having this like secret relationship with this woman. Right. And he's always had this reputation for being super honorable guy. Right. And then someone tries to blackmail him and he's like, Oh, you want to blackmail me by exposing this relationship that I'm having in secret with this woman that I love. Right. Well, fuck you. He immediately walks out and holds like a full assembly with his entire army. And he's like, <laughs> Hey everybody, I want to let you know, I I'm, I'm courting this woman and I I've love loved her, her yeah. for a really long time and I've been keeping it secret, but it's time to let you all know because somebody, this person exactly was yeah. trying to blackmail me about this, Yeah, but I don't want to hide it complete that that is how you get around blackmail, right? You just tell everybody about it. And Kieran and Simon are back at Amy's. Back to Kieran and Simon. They've stormed out of Kieran's house, and they're back at Amy's. And Kieran takes out his contacts, contacts, which he, he hasn't... He takes out his context lenses? Yes, which he do, he hasn't done yet without in front of a mirror where he can see himself. And he starts removing his makeup. Or him. And he looks over and sees Simon. Simon is staring very intensely at Kieran. Oh, Simon is tuned in. Yeah, and so he gets up and starts removing Simon's makeup. Some might call this symbolic. And then we go back to Amy and Philip, which is the best part because they're, Philip is drinking I'm at the so bus glad. stop. Yeah, he's chugging this two liter bottle of hard cider. Right. And Amy shows up and she's like, woo! And, she's and I'm so glad we are on the cute Amy Philip relationship plot line. Yes. And not the Philip compromised his principles for his political career. And now plot he'll line. never have Amy. Yeah. And he'll hate himself forever plot line. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank God. Because she shows up and she's pretending to be drunk. And she has a bottle of liquor. And every time she tips it up, she's not actually drinking. Right. She's just tipping it by her mouth. And he's like, how can you be drunk? And she's like, sense memory? I don't know. <laughs> like, just roll with, roll with me, Philip. I'm, I'm trying to I'm trying to play along with your experience right now. Yeah. Well, first he hears her outside and he's like, who is that? And she goes, it's a zombie. <laughs> <laughs> and she's like, she says, oh, so you were, uh, you were hitting the brothel, huh? And he goes, well, I was only really sleeping with like one, one girl there. And she, he's like. She says, oh, like one girl there? And he's like, yeah, she reminded me of somebody. You. She reminded me of you. I love you. And Amy's like, okay. 
Uh, all right. Thank you, Philip, for this moment of um, revelation. Revelation. And then we see Maxine at a grave. We have to cut this a little bit. It's too, it's too chipper. We have to cut it with something. Yeah. So Maxine's at a grave and she's crying and she's like, not long now. And it's snowing and it's all very dramatic. But then we go back to Philip and Amy because Philip and Amy hooked up. So he's laying there and she's got her head on his arm and she goes, I'm awake. You don't have to chew your arm off. And he goes, well, I thought you'd be the one to chew my arm off. And she goes, I didn't know you told jokes, Philip. And he's like, oh, I uh, I don't. (laughs) (laughs) And then we end the whole episode with Simon at a phone booth and he's on the phone with somebody and he's like, I found the first risen and he's magnificent. And then who's ever on the other line hangs up, and that's the end of the episode. Two more We episodes. only have two more. Holy shit, we have so much to go over in the next two episodes. But we cover so much every episode. I know. These are great and exhausting, and I'm glad there's only six. I feel like if this was like a 15 to 16 episode season, I don't know where we'd go. I don't know what we'd do. I feel like I would run out of steam. I'd be unable to process any more emotional upheaval. So here's what just occurred to me. Yeah. As someone who's gone through the entire uh, Witcher bibliography. Yes. And recognizing how much plot there is in all of the Witcher books. I'd love this guy to adapt the Witcher books. Oh. Oh. Actually go deep into the plot and world building versus the going heavy into the like pretty actiony sequences because there's so much more to that world. Yes, there's so much more interpersonal stuff than yes. just look how cool this guy looks with a sword. Right. And also Yennefer. Right. Yeah, th- that's what just occurred to me now. Yeah. Oh, to give all of those characters it. and all of those interactions the same level of nuance and attention to detail. And, like, realistic personalities. Oof. Heaven forbid we have realistic personalities right. on television shows. They have, like, two and a half characters on The Witcher. and If you add them all together, you mean? And one and a half of them are Yaskir. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. And Geralt's the other one. And then yeah. the rest are just, I don't know, a rope dress and whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. This guy's, I, okay, when we get done with this, I'm going to look him up and see what else he's done. Because the writing in this is superb. The fact that every time I'm like, oh, they're going to zig, they zag. It's fabulous. I love being well, surprised. I, here's what I keep running into. I really hope they zag. I can see a narrative direction going where I would love it to go, but that's the zag direction. And they always zag. they always zig and then they have to spend like two episodes getting back over to where they would have been with the zag, except it's not as good. So whatever. But then this guy just keeps zagging every yeah, time. It's really nice. I get so tired of the post-apocalyptic or like this type of show where you have one nasty male character who has everyone on their side and then we have the one or two spunky free thinkers who are standing up against him and after a while it's just like i would rather die than watch this plot regurgitated one more time And we could have so easily gone that way because we are in a very insular setting. We do not know what is happening in the world at large. We are only seeing Rorton. It is very much an island narrative. And I think that's a really valuable aspect. It is. And I think it could have been something that really torpedoed the show. It really could have been something that brought the show down. But instead, it makes it feel like we are tackling worldwide, globally significant emotional and cultural issues on an, in an intimate scale. 
And I think that works fabulously. And I'm here for it. And I want to know what else this guy wrote so I can watch more of this. But I guess we should probably go watch episode five now. Yeah. Yeah. So speaking of changing the subject, (laughs) sometimes the strangest things are the most beautiful too. So be who you are and love what you love. Until next time, friends. Bye. Bye.